We're only a few weeks away from the September friendlies, the last opportunity for these players on the bubble to prove that they deserve to have a seat, a ticket on the flight to Qatar for the U.S. men's national team. And that means there's only a few games left for these players who are on the bubble to prove themselves to show Greg Berhalter that they deserve to be in that 26 whenever he names his roster for the World Cup. And man, things are heating up. A few of the players on the bubble have really started the season off hot. Maybe none more so than Josh Sargent. The striker who at 17 years old looked to be one of the great strikers in the world has run into some really poor form in the last few years, but has really seemed to turn a corner, has four goals in the last three games for Norwich, and is just cooking, absolutely cooking. Elsewhere, Jordan Pifok and Brendan Vasquez are nipping at his heels with some good performances of their own. Leeds took a step backwards, had their first loss of the season. Uh, probably the worst game so far for Brendan Aronson. Some question marks for, uh, for Jesse Marsh. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about Tyler Adams later. Crisis mode, maybe, for Serginho Dest over at Barcelona. Some scary things to come and why things are probably going to start looking up real soon for Christian Pulisic. All that more on this episode of the Yank Report. What's up? My name is Sam. This is the Yank Report, a show about all things American soccer. If you're into that, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Join us on this road to Qatar as we kind of discuss all the important stories leading up to the world's most important tournament. Now let's get right into all of the action, but before we do, let's hear a word from today's sponsor. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports information from live in-game betting, props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BELIEVE50 to receive 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. We gotta start things off with the Missouri Madman, the Ginger Ninja, the Red Baron, Josh Sargent himself. The man who came out the gates as a youth prospect of one of the most exciting youth prospects the U.S. had ever produced. Coming from the U-17 and U-20 World Cups, he was not just an exciting striker prospect by American standards. He was one of the top young teenagers in the world. And whenever he made his move over to Bremen in Europe, we were expecting big things right out the gate. That's not exactly what we got. We saw some bright spots from Josh, uh, but also some, some struggles. Some struggles that seemed to be reoccurring, and whenever he made the move to Norwich, it was more of the same. Josh ended up moving from the striker position to the winger position because he was converting so few opportunities as a striker, and at winger proved himself to be a pretty competent defensive winger, but not a very dynamic winger, not somebody who's going to be moving up in the world anytime soon or anything like that. Well, in the last few games, Josh has gotten a, a fresh opportunity at the number nine position, and he has seized it, he's taken hold of it, and he looks like a completely different player. You know, players say that moments in your career happen where things just change, where you start seeing the field differently, where things slow down for you. And it seems like one of these moments has occurred from Josh, because last year, I did not see this player. The first few games of the championship season, I did not see this player. And then all of a sudden, he gets a goal or two, and things have completely changed. Whenever I see Josh, whenever I thought think about Josh from last season or previous seasons, what I think about is a player who went into challenges not exactly expecting to win him, went into aerial duels a little shy, um, a player that whenever he got an opportunity in the box always seemed to take one too many touches and give the defender an opportunity to contest him, a player that, gosh, who can forget that open goal opportunity for Norwich where he just didn't put enough on it um, and, and the goalie was able to recover and, and save that. Uh, I mean, a player that it seemed like there was something going on in his brain within him that was keeping him from being the player that we know he can be and all of a sudden it seems like that switch has been flicked all of a sudden he is competing for these balls like I haven't seen him compete uh, in a long time he, he is crashing the box expecting to win the header expecting to beat the defender to the ball and whenever he does get that opportunity he's finishing with authority it's not just the goals that he's scoring don't get me wrong the goals are fantastic but it's not just the goals it's the way that he's competing the way that he is uh, creating shots it's the way that he is pressing uh, it, it's just a, a completely different player a way more confident player and, and what perfect timing with the World Cup only around the corner. Now, Josh Sargent's resurgence 
changes things dramatically for the U.S. Men's National Team striker situation. A few weeks ago, uh, I came on here and said that the three strikers I'm expecting Greg to take to September were going to be Jesus Ferreira, Jordan Peefock, and Brandon Vasquez. Now, all of a sudden, it seems like Josh Sargent absolutely has to have that opportunity uh, to, to get that uh, plane ticket to go to the friendlies in September. But that means there might be an odd man out. Now, maybe Greg Berhalter takes four strikers. I see a lot of people saying that Greg should take four strikers because it seems like there's four guys who deserve an opportunity. But honestly, whenever I think about this September friendly, it's not an opportunity for new guys to come in and, and, and show Greg what they can do. This is a warm-up for the World Cup. This is the last two games. As of right now, I believe there's only two games scheduled. These are the last two games, the last two 90-minute opportunities uh, for Greg to uh, institute what he wants to institute, to build cohesion within his squad, and get the team ready to, uh, to perform whenever they're called upon in November. It's not going to be an opportunity for new guys to come in and show what they can do, and that's the issue I think I have with bringing in four strikers. It's not like It, it seems like a real waste of time to dole out 45 minutes each for each of these four guys uh, to see what they can do. It seems like it would be much more constructive to pick a guy or two and run with that, and that's exactly what I expect to see happen. I expect to see Jesus Ferreira, who I think is the incumbent, who I think is solidified right now in Berhalter's mind, uh, to start both these games and, and to take up the bulk of the minutes. I expect Jordan Peefock to be a guy who, if late in games, Greg needs a striker to come in, win some headers, uh, maybe score a goal in in the box in the thick of things. That's going to be the guy. And I think the change-up striker uh, behind uh, Jesus Ferreira is going to be Josh Sargent at this point, which is a meteoric rise because to start the season, I did not expect that to happen. So an incredible testament to Josh Sargent. Can Josh Sargent come into this camp and beat out Jesus Ferreira? Can he prove that he's just head and shoulders now above Ferreira uh, and be that starter come the World Cup? I don't know. It seems like there's not a lot of opportunity to do that. There's only two games. So unless Jesus has some type of meteoric fall, which I don't think he will, because I think he's still playing well for FC Dallas, even though he's not quite scoring as many goals as Brandon Vasquez right now. Uh, he's, he's a goal or two behind in the race. He's doing so much for FC Dallas. He's just like their absolute best player in their entire offense right now. Um, I, I think he's going to slot in with the U.S. men's national team pretty well. So that's kind of how I see the, uh, the striker situation breaking down. Maybe Greg does take four I really don't see it right now it does not seem like a good use of anybody's time to do that it feels like Brandon Vasquez is going to be on the outside looking in whenever it comes to the September roster which is a crying shame because if Vasquez was playing like he is right now at the beginning of World Cup qualifying you really feel like he would have had an opportunity to come in and prove himself and maybe uh, improving himself it would be the launching pad for him to go on to bigger and better things Maybe he is that good and he just hasn't had that opportunity. Maybe, but it's just, it, it, it's too little too late at this point in the cycle for me. At least I think Greg is dead set on preparing for Qatar, getting ready, and, and bringing in new players to see what they can do is just not going to be what this camp's all about. Moving on to the club that's become every American's either favorite or second favorite EPL club right now, Leeds United. Uh, they suffer their first loss of the season, a game that was really frustrating to watch, a game that was really frustrating for Brendan Aronson, I think, in particular, uh, and probably Jesse Marsh as well. And I, th- I think it's something that we've been s- discussing for the last few weeks in regards to Brendan Aronson. He came out with a really hot start in the first two games. And in those first two games, he had a lot of opportunity to do what he is absolutely best at, which is pursue the ball, use his energy uh, to to, to press, and then whenever opportunities break, uh, to absolutely run at teams in, in transition at disorganized defenses, find those balls in behind, and, and, and be the threat coming in, that third runner into the box to score goals. In this particular game, we saw kind of where we had those question marks about Brennan, and that is what happens whenever the team drops back and doesn't give you those opportunities in transition. That's what Brighton did. So for those that didn't see the game, the way Brighton lined up is, you know, they understood that Leeds has this tremendous press, so they said, you know what, we're not even going to let you guys press us. We're not going to uh, do horizontal passes in the buildup and worry about all that. We're going to try to get right downfield, and if the ball turns over, we're getting our butts back in front of our goals as quickly as possible. So what ended up happening is when Leeds were able to win these balls in these transition moments, if they weren't absolutely perfect with their passing and getting downfield immediately, Brighton was able to, to get back and to form their block and their defense, and Leeds just looked unable or 
unprepared or just had no answers in breaking down that low block. In watching that Leeds game against Brighton, I couldn't help but think about the comparisons between Leeds and the U.S. men's national team. One of the big discussions throughout World Cup qualifying for the U.S. was why does the U.S. play so well at home and struggle so much on the road against these much inferior teams? And we talked about how difficult it is for a team to break down a low block in the press. And and I think that's the big thing with Leeds as well. Leeds' biggest weapon, just like the U.S. men's national team, is that press. And whenever the opposition says, you know what, we're not going to let you press us because we're not going to retain the ball in possession, it nullifies your biggest weapon. And I think we saw that for the U.S. men's national team in away games in World Cup qualifying, and I think we saw that with Leeds. And just like the U.S. men's national team, I think this Leeds squad is going to perform a lot better against teams that are looking to hold the ball versus teams that are willing to concede the ball, concede possession, and defend. I think that's what we saw uh, from this Leeds game over and over again. I think the book is out on Leeds and how to beat Leeds, and if a team is willing to concede possession and sit back, it's going to make things really uncomfortable for Jesse Marsh and Leeds moving forward. Elsewhere in the Premier League, Christian Pulisic started once again on the bench and came in late for Chelsea for some uh, substitute minutes. Not a lot to say about his performance, but I think the important thing to say about Christian Pulisic is midweek games are finally here. Chelsea actually have their first midweek game tomorrow, so maybe by the time you see this, Christian will have already played, but my expectation is now that the midweek games are here, we're going to see Christian starting a lot more games and being a lot more involved. Those first few weeks of the season where it was only one game a week, uh, the starters were able to start the game and rest uh, with enough time to uh, start the next week. Now that there's midweek fixtures and there's a lot, a little bit more fixture congestion, Tuchel's going to have to rotate, and that's where Christian is really going to get his opportunities to come in and shine. What he will do with those opportunities, boy, I hope he seizes them. Uh, it, it, last weekend, Raheem Sterling had a really big game for Chelsea with a brace, kind of showed off why he deserved that big price tag. And if I'm being fair, if I'm being honest, uh, he's had some pretty good moments for Chelsea so far. Uh, he's struggled to find the back of the net, but he's been right there. And now that he's opened his uh, his account scoring goals, uh, he's going to be a tough player to displace in that lineup. However, Chelsea as a whole is still struggling on offense, still struggling to find uh, answers, still struggling to break down teams. So maybe Christian Pulisic can come in and find somewhere in that lineup, carve out a space for him uh, to become a regular member. Either way, I think we're going to have a lot more playing time and a lot more opportunities for Christian Pulisic to get minutes as we head towards November. One player on the bubble who I did not think was going to be a part of this World Cup squad after the July friendlies, who I think is very much in the conversation all of a sudden, is Malik Tillman. And I'll tell you why. It's not just because he's arrived at Rangers, become an immediate starter, is getting Champions League minutes, is performing game in and game out for that club. It's not just because he looks like a competent player out there. Uh, with He looks like a very young player. He has moments where he's really good. He has moments where he's not so good. Uh, kind of a mixed bag, which you'd expect to see out of a young, exciting prospect. But I think the key here for Malik Tillman is that Christian Roldan actually got an injury and is unlikely to be take part in the September camp. Uh, now, maybe Christian Roldan recovers and gets his opportunity, but I feel like at this point, if he hasn't played in this many weeks, uh, maybe uh, Greg will leave him off of, of the plane for, for the September friendlies at least. And that gives somebody an opportunity, somebody in the back half of that roster. And I think somebody like Malik Tillman is really interesting in that role. If you're thinking about players who might be that 26 player on the roster, you know, you're looking at guys like, Christian Roldan, Jordan Morris, Paul Areola, and Malik Tillman. And what I think what makes Malik Tillman interesting out of those guys is compared to Paul Areola and Jordan Morris, Malik Tillman can play a few more positions. He can play the right or the uh, or the left inside forward, but he can also play that attacking midfielder position, the position that Brendan Aronson was playing in the, in the July windows, which that versatility, I think, gives him a little bit of an edge. I think it's also fair to say that in playing in the Champions League and, and establishing himself at Rangers, Malik Tillman has at least put himself in the conversation with Paul Areola, who I don't think is playing quite as well in, in the back half of the season as he was in the front half of the season. And even if he was, I, I think 
Paul Areola is a known quantity, and Malik Tillman is a little bit of a mystery, and I think that that might add something to give you that that 26 player, uh, make it a young player, and give him an opportunity at the World Cup. It's a, it's an interesting positional battle that's developed all of a sudden, and it's really developed because Malik Tillman has been performing so well for Rangers. And I don't think you can talk about Malik Tillman performing well for Rangers without mentioning James Sands. And if you want to mention James Sands, I think you have to talk about this brewing center back battle that's sort of uh, started up within the discourse of the U.S. men's national team. Uh, people are really lobbying for a fifth center back spot to go out either to Tim Ream or James Sands. Both players are coming into the season performing well and starting games for their clubs. And I think it's an interesting discussion because I, I think both players are kind of similar in what they offer to this club. Uh, Tim Ream, of course, is is not a very physical defender. He's not going to win those one-on-one duels and, and cover space like Greg Berhalter wants. But he can slot in at left back. Uh, he is an old head in the locker room. He does seem to be a great locker room guy. So he does bring some of those intangibles. He has the versatility and he has the leadership that he can bring to the group. He is a captain for Fulham. Uh, so maybe his impressive performances make him in the conversation for that 25th, 26th roster spot. James Sands, on the other hand, is a much younger player, has a lot more opportunity um, left in his career as opposed to Tim Ream, who's kind of on the back end of his career. But James Sands is also quite a versatile player. James Sands can also play multiple positions on the back line, as well as sub in as a defensive midfielder if we need cover there. So he offers some interesting tactical intangibles as well to the club. Neither Sands or Ream are what I would consider a prototypical Greg Berhalter center back at this point. But, you know, we got to bring 26 guys one way or another. So, you know, it's an interesting conversation to have at this point. Now, it's not all good news. There are a few causes for concerns out there. And the first one, I think, is a big one. It's a doozy. And it's it's Serginho Dest. Uh, the Serginho Dest, Dest situation has really deteriorated over at Barcelona. There are reports that Xavi has come out and said that he doesn't want Dest in his squad, that he's not going to play a minute for Barcelona this season, and that he should uh, seek other clubs. And, and it seems like the word out a desk camp is that Des wants to be a player at Barcelona, that he's going to stick it out, that he's going to fight to be a part of that group. There's a lot of rumors that he's building a house in Barcelona and that he wants to be in it for the long haul, that he's just been, um, he's loved Barcelona since he was a kid and that's where he wants to be. So there's a good shot at this point that Serginho Des is just out in the cold and isn't getting any minutes at all as we head towards November, which is a very scary situation because Serginho Dust is a very likely starter for the U.S. men's national team at right back. Moving on, Tim Weah has been out with an injury for Lil. He hasn't registered a minute at all in August, uh, and, and we're coming up to September, and now there's questions about whether or not he will be a part of that September uh, friendly window. So, that's a scary situation that might open up more opportunities for other people along the roster, uh, depending on how that goes. We expect Tim Weah to be a big part of the World Cup squad, so to not have him in September is a little scary. And probably the scariest of them all is uh, Gio Reyna. Gio Reyna was held out of a game uh, for Borussia Dortmund because it, there was complaints about the injury that he had. We know that Borussia Dortmund is having a lot of caution whenever it comes to Gio's injury right now. He's missed a considerable amount of time, and they really don't want him getting hurt again. Uh, so he was held out. Now, the expectation is that it was just you know a minor thing, and he's expected to be back with the club shortly. Hopefully, it's nothing big to worry about, but I think it's concerning nonetheless for those of us who just desperately want to see Gio back on the field. So that's my Road to Guitar update of the week. I'm curious about what you guys thought about the week that was in American soccer. What did you think about the Leeds game? What did you think about Brendan Aronson's performance? Am I being a bit too harsh? Probably so, right? What about the striker situation? Do you think Josh Sargent should be starting? Do you think Josh Sargent is in the mix? Where do you see Josh Sargent? Who are your three strikers that you expect Greg to take in the September window and potentially in Qatar as well? And what about Christian Pulisic? What about Gio Reyna? Are you as concerned about these situations? as I am. Let me know in the comment section. As always, si puede hablar espanol. Déjame un comentario en espanol. Guys, thank you so much to everybody who supported the Since 76 launch this, this week. Uh, we had a great week, and I'm really excited to get those shirts out to you guys uh, to see you uh, rocking them wherever it is that you rock shirts. If you want the Yank Report and Podcast form, you can find it anywhere you get your podcast. so make sure you check that out. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can subscribe, you can like, uh, or you can become a member 
Being a member really helps out the channel directly and helps keep these videos coming. Shout out to my tier two members, Mike Irish, Manuel Alivetis, Matt Doyle, Matthew Hanna, Michael Baker, and Chris Matassa. I appreciate you guys so much. Guys, thank you so much for watching. My name is Sam, and this is the Yank Report brought to you by Bet Online.